EMIGs and medical students. So our first day we had just an intro talk and then a discussion about uh, emergency medicine in the military. Yesterday we had a talk about how to prepare from MS1 through MS4 and then um, favorite topic title ever, four letter words, ERAS, VSAS, STEP. And today we are continuing on with um, Dr. RJ Sontag. He has served as the chair of the EMRA Health Policy Committee in 2018 and 2019, and he's the president-elect of the EMRA Board of Directors. He is Texas trained as a graduate of the UT Health San Antonio Emergency Medicine Residency Program. And I'm excited to introduce Dr. Sontag and let him speak on his, something he's very passionate about, um, health policy and advocacy. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you for that invitation. I'm really excited to sort of virtually be back home in Texas or to where my temporary home was. Um, as we discussed right before we came on, the weather is lovely here in Ohio, but the Tex-Mex food is not so good. So um, I do wish that I were there in person with you so I could experience that a little bit. Uh, I'm going to work on sharing my screen right now. I feel like in the Zoom era, everybody talks about sharing their screen rather than just sharing their screen. And it's not working, so we're going to work on that a little bit. I don't think it's you guys. I think it's me. Um, so I do want to share it because I have 146 slides prepared, which I know sounds overwhelming, but don't worry. Almost none of them have any words on them. It's just the actual slides. Um, is the share screen button not working? It is. Okay. No, it's, um, I think it's something about screen recording, but I think I just had to give permission okay. to record the screen and then it will work. Okay, do you guys see my slide? Do you see anything else? I don't think I left any other windows open. Just the so we're slide. Go with it. Okay, great. Looks great. Awesome. Okay, so I call this talk caring for patients means caring about policy. And I'll get into why I talk about that a little bit, but I want to expand on the introduction Lauren gave me because um, I um, have kind of a unique background. So I actually started my political career or my career period in politics. I had always been interested in medicine, but I wanted to find bigger ways to change the world, quite frankly. I was, um, I don't know how people commit to medicine at 18 years old, going through undergrad as a commitment and going right into medical school. I needed a break. So I'm actually 10 years non-traditional. Um, so this is when I, where I got started in Columbus. This is the mayor of Columbus and some city council members. I worked on local campaigns and then basically would work in their offices writing policy um, after that. I worked on um, uh, uh, campaigns from the local to the federal level. I worked on a couple presidential campaigns. I won't uh, share my biases, but talking about the candidates that I worked for, but um, to be honest, when candidates that I worked for eventually lost their campaigns, I decided to give up politics and uh, all that came with it and went into medicine. Um, I got super involved in, um, I'm having trouble moving my screen right now. There we go. Okay, uh, I got involved in policy, however, right away because I saw how it was affecting my patients. Um, and I wrote a chapter in this book, that's actually the old edition, um, the Emergency Medicine uh, Advocacy Handbook, which I'm super excited about. It's on surprise billing, which we'll talk about today if we have time. And if you guys, guys don't get too bored about surprise billing. So I immediately found myself interested in it again. I created a podcast called Emerging, um, which is now um, uh, dormant, but it was a way for me to find my policy voice because I knew I was interested in policy and finding a way to connect that with medicine. I got super involved in different groups like TSEP, like EMRA, and like ASEP. And I found a home in people who were also interested in these policies with me. Uh, EMRA uh, awarded me the Congressional Health Policy Fellowship last year. So I actually got to spend a month on Capitol Hill working for Congressman Raul Ruiz, who's an emergency physician, one of only a couple emergency physicians in Congress, where I got to actually, I wrote uh, a bill that passed the House of Representatives, fingers crossed that it passes the Senate, but hashtag 2020, we'll see. Um, it was an amazing experience. Um, this is uh, one of the hearings that we went to for firearm violence reduction back when uh, we still cared about those things. That's Dr. Ruiz, John Lewis, who you may know of as a civil rights advocate, uh, advocate who just passed away, congressman from Georgia, and of course the Speaker of the House. 
And then I joined the EMRA board. Um, I'm really proud to be a member of the EMRA board when we have the most diverse board in our history, most diverse when it comes to women, uh, so gender, ethnicity, LGBTQ status, we're, we're really proud of that. So I, talk, I, I call this talk caring for policy, or excuse me, caring for patients means caring about policy. And I'll just get into the elephant in the room. Y'all went into medicine because you care about medicine. We're not in an MPH class right now. We're in, y'all are medical students. So I know you didn't choose medicine because you chose health policy, but the fact is this affects your patients. And so it's not something that you really have the luxury of ignoring. It matters for our patients um, because patients are healthier when they have health insurance. It's just the case. They are healthier when they have access to health care. I'll give you some examples. We write prescriptions when our uh, patients leave the hospital, yet one in four who don't have insurance don't even fill those prescriptions. So when I write a prescription for a patient with pyelonephritis, who I think probably fly without getting admitted, if he or she doesn't even fill the prescription, then how are they going to get better? What's going to happen to that patient? They're going to bounce right back. Um, People without insurance are more likely to have a later diagnosis, to get less treatments, and to die in the hospital. And I chose this picture on purpose of an African-American dying in the hospital because there are huge inequities in who doesn't have insurance. 50% of people who don't have insurance, of course, are, uh, I'm sorry, you're 50% more likely not to have health insurance if you're black than if you're white. And you're more likely to be less healthy if you don't have health insurance. In fact, half the people in this country who don't have health insurance have at least one chronic condition. These are a lot of people who really need our care. And of course, I'm sure you're all aware that COVID has only exacerbated the health disparities that exist in the uninsured with uh, uh, minorities getting and dying of COVID at much higher rates than, than whites. But maybe you're a numbers person. Maybe you are a little harder. You are moved a little bit less by the health disparities, by uh, arguments about race and class, and you care about the bottom line. But there's a strong argument to be made that purely from an economic point of view, health insurance and health access matters. And that's because health coverage, paying for health care expenses, eats up one fourth of people's savings every year. And I didn't state that quite correctly. One fourth of all people in the country have their savings wiped out every single year by health expenses. That's a ton of money that could be used for productive other reasons. So how does it affect you as a physician? Well, quite frankly, we get paid when people can afford to pay us. And if they have health insurance, they're more likely to be able to pay us. Also, having more access to healthcare and preventative medicine theoretically means that our emergency rooms will be less crowded. Of course, we can talk about whether that's actually been the case later on. So if you all have questions, my plan is to save some time at the end, and that's certainly one that we can talk about. But it's not just uh, making sure that you can get paid at the end of the day. Policy affects so many things. It affects your ability to land a residency, which we'll talk about a little bit. It affects your ability to actually get a job when you get out of residency. And of course, it affects your ability to get paid a good rate for that job when you get out of residency. So there's a lot that we can agree on so far. We can all agree that we'd like our patients to have better insurance coverage, better access. We'd like to reduce health disparities. We'd like to improve the economy. We'd all like to be actual well-paid emergency physicians. But here's the problem. Every single thing that I've talked about so far is at risk right now. So I'd like to talk about these issues right here. I'd like to talk about workforce problems. I'd like to talk about the rise of NPPs and how that affects us. I'd like to talk about surprise billing and the prudent layperson standard. And I'd like to talk about some solutions to all of these things. I know that I have a lot of slides here, so my goal is to be able to click to different parts here if we run out of time. So Lauren, please don't hesitate to shoot me an email or a message if I'm running out low on time and I will speed through these. But uh, I'm going to talk about the ones that I think will affect you first, and then I'm going to talk about the ones that will affect our patients and our profession. So hopefully that's not too selfish. Don't tell people that I started this way. So let's talk first about match day. I know uh, the MS4s are thinking a lot about match day and getting a residency. Just as a quick aside, I remember being in med school in my first, second, and third years, and everybody saying, fourth year is so great. You're going to have a great time. You have so much more free time. You get to go on residency interviews. But I found fourth year to be really anxiety-provoking. I was anxious the entire year. Um, yes, I had free time, but trying to do a ways was really scary. I can't even imagine what it's like in the COVID era. Um, I trying to figure out how many programs to apply to 
whether or not you should trust your advisor, which I promise you, you should trust your advisor. Emra's got great resources too if you need assistance. Um, and I'll give you my email at the end so that you can reach out to me if you need. But, um, and then having to do a rank list, having to figure out how many places to interview, waiting for match day, and then having to totally uproot your life in many cases and move across the country after match day, all in a very short amount of time. I thought it was terribly stressful. I did not like fourth year. So anyway, maybe I'm an anxious person, but if you're feeling that way, know that at least you're not alone. So when it comes to residency and matching in residency, maybe you'll be happy to know that there's been a huge growth in the number of residency slots recently. Um, and it is era season. I know you already had the four letter word, so I'll get rid of this screen so it doesn't keep you up at night. But this is an important chart. It's a little busy. I'm sorry I didn't try to recreate this chart. But what you need to really focus on here is that this is the growth in residency positions in the last five years. And if you look, emergency medicine leads the pack. We've had 24% more residency positions in the last five years. That sounds super great as a fourth year medical student. You're gonna have a much easier time matching than you would have five years ago. That sounds good. But of course, the problem is, the more people that we have going through residency, the more people that we have graduating residency, which means you have more competition when you're applying for jobs. And of course, employers love this. The CMGs love this. Everybody loves this because it means you have to be paid less. And of course, in the era of COVID, it only exacerbates the problem. So residency growth is problematic in many ways. We can talk about that. I'm going to avoid the controversial parts of that right now. I've kind of introduced them a little bit. Again, if you want to talk about some controversy at the end, there will be time. Um, but, and I'm going to take another aside here and just talk about the fact that when I, I signed my contract in September of last year to move home to Ohio, and that's where I am now for those who weren't on the call earlier. Um, I am an attending physician. I'm a brand new little baby attending in my first month and I'm loving it. But I had a 15% cut in my pay after I signed the contract that I wasn't able to negotiate. It was not a choice. I was told you are taking a 15% cut. I'm actually kind of lucky. I had many friends who had their contracts rescinded in the spring when COVID hit um, because of the reductions in emergency room volume. I had a friend who moved across the country. His spouse quit their job and they bought a house. And then after all of those things happened, then he had his contract rescinded. Can you imagine what that's like? And so now he's cobbling together work in the area that he's in and um, several states away. He's moonlighting at places he was moonlighting at during residency. It's a really stressful position to be in. So creating additional residency slots really does make a difference. But it's not just, oh, that was what I was going to use to show me popping champagne when I got my first job. But I did not realize, of course, at that time that I was going to have a big pay cut. So that's the workforce issue, creating more positions that are maybe sustainable and how it affects your bottom line. But there's another thing that hugely affects your bottom line too, and that is NPPs. If you're not familiar with the term NPPs, get familiar with it. It's going to affect you big time. It stands for non-physician providers. There's a lot of different words and names that we give our nurse practitioners and our physician's assistants who are vital parts of the emergency department and are really important for us. Um, Mid-levels was a term used traditionally. But as NPs and PAs wanted to exert more authority and have the ability to practice more independently, they no longer wanted to be called mid-levels. They started to want to be called advanced practice providers. Um, the, the term that's becoming more in favor with physicians, quite frankly, is non-physician provider, NPP. And that's because we think it's important to distinguish between a physician and a physician's training as, as opposed to a nurse or uh, a PA who has uh, an extra two-year degree. Um, NPPs are a real threat to emergency medicine. And it's a balance. We can talk about it at the end also, but we need them, we rely on them, but in a way there's a threat. This is the rise in NPPs, how many percent, the percentage of patients that NPPs have been seeing over the last 20 years. As you can see, it's growing big every year. And their training, lest you forget, is significantly less than our training. On the left here is the training that you'll get. On the right is a nurse practitioner who can start in the emergency department after having an average of 658 hours total of experience. Think how many hours you've spent in med school alone, work studying for tests, maybe even in a semester you cover that many hours. It's really shocking that they can work side by side with you. Now, there's an argument. Um, oh, and by the way, of course, they're helping drive your cost down or your um, 
uh, pay down too. But there's an argument that, well, Dr. Sontag, they're going to fill the roles that other people don't want. They're going to work in primary care. We need more primary care providers, which sounds great, but look where they're going. They're not running into primary care. They're going into emergency medicine. They're coming for our positions because they know that it's an excellent specialty to be into. But so then you can make an argument that they're going into rural slots. Texas, uh, and I, I saw people from Iowa here, from New Mexico, from Texas, even from Washington here, we have a ton of rural areas in this country where we already have underserved patients, we have underfunded hospitals, we need emergency providers in those areas. So maybe if we have more NPPs, NPPs will go to the rural areas. Sounds like a good idea, but of course, that's not what's happening. That's not what's happening either. This is a busy slide. So again, let me break it down. Um, the light blue is emergency physicians. You can see we like to uh, work in large areas, large urban areas. That tends to be the case for most physicians. Um, when we don't want to work in uh, the rural areas as much, family physicians actually fill. So these are not board certified, board eligible in emergency medicine. They're family physicians or the little red there, the maroon is um, internal medicine. They tend to pick up the pieces. But MPPs are not picking up the pieces, people. They are not going uh, out into the rural areas to fill the slots, to fill the gap. They want to live in the same place as we want to live, which is acceptable. That's totally fine. But then at the same time, you can't use it as an argument for increasing NPP training. Uh, and so I think this is super important. MPPs have a very vocal, obvious, admitted bias. They want independent practice. They want no physicians overseeing them. They want to be able to order any diagnostic test, treat as many patients as they would like, have be able to write any prescription that they would like without any physician oversight. And in the blue states here, this is from their website where they're talking about where they can have full practice, independent practice. In the blue states here, they've already got it. They've already won the fight. The red states here are states where um, uh, they're highly restricted. In the yellow, it's kind of a mix. Um, but as like so many things, this year, COVID has really shaken this up. When New York was getting just devastated by COVID in the spring, Governor Cuomo, perhaps rightly, did expand um, NPP rights. I say perhaps rightly. What I mean is we needed more help in New York than we were able to get. And so they made the decision to, uh, he made the decision to have an executive order that allowed uh, independent practice. I don't know that it made sense at that time, but you can see the argument and where it's coming from. The problem is, Though so that was done in April, it's been extended. And so in all of these states, all the, the states with the colors, so the super light gray are states where they already have independent practice. The um, darkest blue states are places where they got COVID expansions for independent practice, and then they've been fully uh, rolled back. But all the other colors of blue here are states where they got independent practice, and we've now had extensions of the independent practice. Now, I think most of you are back in the hospital setting now, and I can tell you, we're not getting overrun by COVID cases. We're at a much more manageable level. And again, my, my pay is still getting cut because our volumes are still down. We do not need extra independent practice extended to nurse practitioners and PAs right now, yet that's what's happening. It's one of those slippery slope arguments. And the reason that happens is because nurses are spectacular at lobbying. They show up. They show up in numbers. They love marching on Capitol Hill. They love going to state houses and they raise their voices and they make very compelling cases for independent practice. I'm going to tell you about my very first Hill Day when I was in Ohio. I was a medical student in Ohio. I was involved with Ohio ASA and I went to meet with the state legislator. I was super nervous, all dressed up in my suit and tie. And I went to like a coffee with the legislator and I was talking about this issue and about the training differences. And the legislator said to me, you know, I would like if I have to go on a trip to take a Cadillac on that trip. But if I have to take a used Honda, that's a cheaper way to get me there. That'll still get me there. And that was the argument clearly that NPPs had been using. But of course, it is not the difference between two cars that will take you in the exact same direction in the same way. It's, it's closer to like an airplane versus a space shuttle. NPPs simply don't have the training and don't have the ability to do what we do, yet they're incredibly effective communicators at convincing people that they have those same abilities. And so that's sort of what we're up against. Okay, so we've talked about workforce, we've talked about NPPs, 
doing great on time. This is not a lecture you're going to be able to watch on double speed. Forgive me if I'm talking too fast. But I'm going to move on to surprise billing. This is an issue that I think probably most of us have heard of. If you haven't heard of it, you need to have heard of it. And I'm going to sort of introduce it to you a little bit and talk about it, even though with COVID, it's been sort of placed on the back burner. So this is an example of a patient with chest pain comes to the emergency department. He's had recent elective surgery at a hospital. So he goes there because he already knows the, the place is in his insurance network. Um, when he gets in there, he's diagnosed with a STEMI. Um, the cath lab is activated. A cardiologist afor, uh, performs a left heart cath and places a stent in LED. His life is saved, hooray. He goes home on the appropriate diabetes, hypertension medicines, the good cardioprotective medicines, um, and he's insured. So he's actually able to fill all of those prescriptions and he takes them instead of just filling a couple of them. So here's a question. If the hospital that he went to is in network, will he get extra bills for out of network payments? Will things like the hospital um, services, like the, just the overhead be covered? Will the nurses that he um, sees be covered? Will the emergency physician be covered? Will the cardiologist be covered? And the answer is, well, it depends. It depends on your insurance. It depends on which hospital you go to. But going into an in-network hospital would guarantee overhead and nursing services. But the emergency department physician and the cardiologist are not necessarily covered in-network in that hospital that is in-network, which seems crazy. But let's talk about how we got here. I'm gonna start by talking about EMTALA. I hope that since you're going into emergency medicine, you know what EMTALA is, but I know that we have a broad audience, so I'm just going to make sure that I introduce it just to be on the safe side. Emergent, uh, EMTALA is the Emergency Medis Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. Pretty sure that that's what that stands for. Somebody's welcome to put it in chat if I missed up one of those letters. Um, but it essentially is um, a, a, a role or a rule that says everybody has to be treated day or night, regardless of their ability to pay in the emergency department. And the story of EMTALA is a great one. So I wanna talk about it. I think it's a real policy win. In the 70s and 80s, patients started to be transferred from private hospitals to public ones if they were uninsured or underinsured. So here in Texas, in Parkland, um, in Dallas, um, they started keeping track of those transfers, patients that they were getting from the private hospitals um, because they were uninsured. And in the mid 80s, when they were tracking, they had one year that 1,987 of those patients were transferred because they were uninsured. Almost 2,000 patients like that. And for 537 of those hospitals, they weren't, or of those transfers, the receiving hospital wasn't even notified about the transfer when it was coming. Now, these aren't stable patients. These are, the, people from the 80s will tell you these are patients who had knives sticking out of their backs. These are women who were in labor and ended up delivering before they even got to Parkland. People with gunshot wounds to the abdomen, things that we know are absolute surgical emergencies. So Parkland actually started recording the phone calls when the transfers, when the transfer calls were made. And in one of those calls, the transferring doctor said, she doesn't have insurance and this hospital doesn't wanna take care of her, okay? We're private, we're capitalistic, we're a money-making hospital and they're on my back to have her transferred. And so these patients would arrive with the other hospitals banned all still on when they got to uh, Parkland's emergency department. And so this doctor came up with a plan. He decided to cut off all the old bands from the old uh, hospitals and he saved them. And when word started to get out nationally that this was happening, there were congressional hearings. And he went to the US Capitol, this emergency physician, and had his box of uh, wristbands and he dumped it out and the camera zoomed closer and he picked up the different wristbands and started telling the stories of the patients who died when they were transferred or the babies who died because they had an emergency delivery in the back of an ambulance because they had to be transferred. And so in 1986, Ronald Reagan signed EMTALA. And this may come as a surprise to you, but this is the first time that we had guaranteed healthcare as a human right in this country in 1986 signed by a Republican. I think that's a really interesting and important point because of course right now if you tried to say guaranteed health care, you know, words like socialist would be used. Yet when this originally occurred in 1986, it was a bipartisan effort to help try to guarantee health care. So 
EMTALA doesn't, of course, cover emergency doctors. Every time we pick up the phone to call a consultant, they have a legal, legal obligation to see the patient. And if that hospital doesn't have that specialty, like cardiology or ophthalmology, um, then an on-call specialist at another facility is legally required to accept that transfer. So we're required by law to provide care. And I think that's a good thing. But there is no law, of course, about who has to pay for that care. So let's talk about what that means. If that patient with chest pain goes to an in-network hospital, they may have an out-of-network physician working there. And so they could end up getting a bill. So this is a pie chart that basically represents what your insurance will actually pay and what it doesn't pay. And I want to be clear, this is a pretty complicated situation. I don't know if any of you have your health insurance card handy, but I would challenge you if you do to get it out and look and see what your deductible is. Find out what your deductible is. Find out what your copay is. Find out if you have coinsurance. Because if you go to see any physician right now, you're going to have to pay those things before your insurance covers anything. And if you have a $5,000 deductible, which is not uh, unheard of. My deductible right now with my husband is $10,000 with this new health insurance that I'm getting that kicks in September 1st. These are high deductible plans. And so that's a whole bunch of money that I'm going to have to pay for. And the, when a patient gets that bill, they immediately say, why are you charging so much doc? Why does the CT cost so much doc? Why does the hospital facility fee cost so much? When, when in reality, it's just that the patients don't understand their insurance plan, or they don't understand that it's out of network and so they have an even higher deductible. Um, it really makes a difference too because a third of people who struggle with medical bills struggle because of balance bills, these surprise bills. And we do our best to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, emergency physicians, that's what this is supposed to represent, is responsible for about 50% of these bills. So 50% of the care that is ends up being out of network is outlers. And Part of that is because um, we don't have contracts with all the insurance companies. This is a complicated situation, again, ripe with controversy. But basically, sometimes we're willing to go in network and accept a lower payment with an insurance company like Aetna or Anthem. If they're willing to take care of our billing for us, um, it makes a lot of good sense. They bill the patients, we don't have to deal with that, and we're willing to take a pay cut for that. But when the insurance company doesn't offer you fair market value, then you have to say, is it even worth it to be in, in network with this company if they're, if they're gonna pay me $50 for that STEMI treatment? That doesn't make sense. I work my butt off for that STEMI. I deserve to be compensated, for, especially given my level of education. And so the problem is, uh, and by the way, of course, health insurance companies love this because when they're out of network, they don't have to pay for those extra bills. The patients end up paying those extra bills when they go to the out of network hospital. And so you have a situation where you have physicians on one side trying to make sure that they're fairly paid. Insurance companies arguably wanting to make sure that they're not overpaying, very fair. And you have the patient in the middle of all of this. And while I'm not a big government fan, I don't think government should regulate medicine any more than they absolutely have to. This is one area where I think government needs to step in. I think government needs to take action and keep the patient out of the middle. Keep, since obviously the physicians and the insurance companies can't agree, find a solution for that. There are many solutions that have been proposed. I'm already at 9.30, so I'm not gonna talk about the solutions that have been proposed for this, but they're really, really interesting, and I would love to, um, at the end or um, uh, if, if you all wanna have a conversation separately, because this is an excellent place for people to be getting involved with. And actually on that, um, policy handbook that I had, that is actually the chapter that I wrote was on surprise billing. So this is a topic that I genuinely enjoy. So I'm going to move on though to the prudent layperson standard. Let me find out where I am in my notes. I always have to print out my notes so that I don't get too lost. And this is the reason why. Okay, so let's talk again about that patient with chest pain. So um, I just said that the emergency department has to treat that patient when they have chest pain because of EMTALA, which I love. I love that I'm a member of the only specialty that takes care of every patient day or night, regardless of their ability to pay. That is the social justice mission of emergency medicine. We're the only specialty like that, and I happen to love it. So um, let's say that a patient has chest pain. They research in advance to know that everybody that they're gonna come in contact with is in network. So they go to the emergency department for their chest pain. If everybody's in network, no question, 
does the insurance company have to pay for that emergency department visit? Well, the question is, it depends, like so many things. So let's talk about the prudent layperson standard. In the United States, we have this, and it was created during EMTALA to discuss what is an emergency. And basically, the prudent layperson standard says that if you have acute symptoms of sufficient severity, if you are concerned for the health of your unborn child, you believe that it may be in jeopardy, if you believe that you may, uh, by not seeking care, have impairment in your bodily functions, or that you may have dysfunction of an organ. If you are a prudent layperson who believes you're having one of those emergency situations, you have the right to emergency care. That is the heart of EMTALA. So after EMTALA passed, patients no longer had to worry. If they think that they're having an emergency, they knew that they could go to the emergency department and get treated. And, but what immediately happened after 1986 is insurers tried to find ways to not have to pay this. So what they started to do is they started to force patients to get pre-approvals for an emergency department visit. And if you didn't get approved, they wouldn't pay. So if you have chest pain in the 80s and the early 90s, you would have to pick up the phone and call your insurance company and say, is my chest pain of sufficient severity that you would pay for my visit if I went to the emergency department? And if you couldn't get a hold of them, and if you couldn't get permission, you could still go to the emergency department, but I hope you bring your checkbook with you. So also, by the way, this is proof that you can find a stock photo for everything because I Googled chest pain phone and this is what I found. And even though it has the big like shutter stock thing over it, it's the perfect photo. So I love it. I hope you all use very visual uh, PowerPoints when you do your PowerPoints. And so a law was passed because, of course, the first law wasn't good enough. Um, and Maryland was the first state that stopped the pre-approval process in 1993. So it took many years for this to sort of bear out. Um, and then um, federal health insurance in 1998 adopted this also. So if you had a federal, federal plan, which of course most of us have like state regulated plans, so it didn't cover most of us, but Clinton put that in place. And then with the passage of the Affordable Care Act in 2010, essentially all insurers are banned from requiring pre-approval for emergency department visits. It's actually kind of a new thing but you have to meet that prudent layperson standard. The problem, of course, is that the same symptoms can lead to a very different diagnosis. Y'all are far enough in medical school that you know this, that chest pain can be a lot of things. It can be GERD, or it can be an aortic dissection extending down to the heart and, having, and causing cardiac tamponade, right? So the, the prudent layperson standard is very complicated. And to be honest, as a physician, if I got right lower quadrant pain that started maybe periumbilical and now is in the right lower quadrant, maybe I've got a little nausea, maybe I've got a little temperature, I wouldn't know if I had an appendicitis. I could go to a hospital, I could go to an emergency department, they could do a CAT scan, they could find that I have no surgical emergency, that I do not need antibiotics, that maybe it's just a little constipation and I need to get more water and fiber in my diet and send me home with constipation. And the insurance company wouldn't necessarily pay for that. And that's huge. I think I'm a fairly well-trained physician and I can't tell without emergency department testing whether or not I have appendicitis. So insurance companies, we'll use Anthem as an example, have started capitalizing on this. They're a very profitable insurance company. This is how much they were worth before the Affordable Care Act passed. This is how much they were worth in 2018 after the Affordable Care Act. They've done very well for themselves. Um, and in 2018, they had $3.8 billion in profit, billion with a B. That sounds like a lot. Maybe it's worth it, but this is interesting because last quarter, they made $6.6 .6 billion in that quarter alone. This is a very profitable company. But so what Anthem has started doing is saying that in these states, if you go to the emergency department and it's later found that you had constipation, not appendicitis, we're not going to pay your bill. If we determine at the end that the diagnosis is not emergent, not the presentation, but the diagnosis is not emergent, we're not going to pay the bill. And so Texas was the most recent state added. Um, and what happened, though, is that doctors stepped up, doctors and medical students, people like you, basically stormed the legislature and stormed Governor Abbott's office and said, this cannot happen. This is bad for our patients. And these aren't just 
uh, imaginary thing. So I had a patient with nausea come into the emergency department. She was 75. She was only there because her daughter forced her to come into the hospital. Her only symptom was nausea, but the daughter said that something is not right. There's just something not right with her. She never gets sick. We need, we need to uh, have her evaluated. Also, speaking of stock photos, since I like that stock photo, this is when I, I tried to Google grandma sick and I got grandma with a stick. And when I clicked on her picture, I just went down a hole. Grandma got a gun. Grandma stole your money. Grandma's a little intense. Okay, so anyway, back to my patient with nausea because this is kind of serious. So she had nausea, nausea, of course, she had a STEMI. You can already predict where this went because women often prevent not, or present non-traditionally with their uh, MI symptoms. And so if she had never come in for her nausea, we never would have found her STEMI. But of course, if we had not found a STEMI, if we did a complete workup and only found nausea, Anthem might not pay for it. And just in case you think that this is theoretical, like of course Anthem likes to say it is, they've started not paying bills. So uh, there was a case of a woman in Georgia who was in a high-speed MVC and came in with neck pain, came in on a collar. What do you do but scan her, get a CT scan? She had no fractures. She was diagnosed with neck pain as her final diagnosis, and Anthem refused to pay the bill. They said neck pain is not an emergency situation. We're not going to pay the bill. Other people with constipation have had their bills. Done. So again, um, if Anthem gets their way, Anthem, 6.6 .6 billion in profit last quarter. If they get their way, and if our federal and state governments don't step up to stop it, then we're gonna turn back the clock 25 years to when people in Texas had to pick up the phone and call their, and call their insurance companies to find out, is this a significant enough presentation that if the final diagnosis is not emergent that you'll still cover it? That's not really cost-effective care. That's not really patient-centered care if you ask me. And sometimes, Yeah, sorry. Sometimes when I think about it, I get pretty overwhelmed. When I think that I'm gonna have more competition to make less money, that MPPs who have way less education than I do are working to replace me, I start to feel worried about my patients. But I also worry that getting involved in policy feels kind of icky sometimes. It's a very divisive country right now, and there's a lot of infighting and a lot of arguing. and. I sometimes wonder, can we as physicians and physicians in training even make a difference? And the simple answer is yes. And if you indulge me for a second, I'd like to present a little bit of a history lesson to show that in fact, physicians are the only force that matters. So we're gonna go all the way back to 1901, back to the creation of the American Medical Association. This was our first national group of doctors uh, and we wanted to make sure that our voices were united because we realized that with a united voice as an organization, we would be more powerful. And in fact, the first thing we did was we started charging for our services. There was a time when doctors didn't always charge for their services or didn't charge uh, consistently. But once we banded together, we said, let's charge money. We, need, we deserve to make money for these things. Now, during that time, America was not paying for healthcare. Europe started to pay for healthcare for its citizens, but America was not. We had a railroad boom, tons of railroads being built in this country. And so railroads said, well, hey, Europe is paying for healthcare, America is not. We wanna attract employees and keep them from the other guy or girl. So let's offer healthcare as a benefit. So railroads actually started this whole relationship between employers offering healthcare benefits for patients and not the federal government. And doctors, of course, did just fine with that because then we started to make sure that we were getting guaranteed payment. So right away, doctors are starting to charge money, employers are starting to pay the money. In the 19 teens, it started to look like the United States was actually going to be a country that provided healthcare to its citizens, that actually funded healthcare. But then World War I happened and it totally derailed the efforts. Ooh, derailed is good when I'm talking about railroads. I'm gonna have to focus on that more next time. Okay, sorry. Uh, in the 1920s, doctors started making some pretty good money, which gave us prestige. It gave us an outsized voice. The American Medical Association was becoming more powerful. And more and more companies started offering health insurance. When the Great Depression hit, more social programs were created, things like Social Security, but universal health coverage never took off. And then, of course, World War II happens, derails efforts once again. And I don't know how many of you know this, but to offset inflation, the federal government actually banned um, uh, raises for 
employees. So if you were a private company like GM at the time, um, uh, then you could not give your employee a raise for a significant period of time in World War II. You couldn't give anybody a raise. So the only way that you could set yourself apart and attract new employees would be to offer benefits. And that's when health insurance benefits really took off by private employers and they started to become so rich because we literally had no other way of incentivizing um, people. So right now, again, we're further saying that uh, having a job means health insurance and that is the only way that you get it. Now, Truman and Roosevelt tried to fund government health insurance. They thought, this sounds good, we'll make sure that everybody gets it instead of just people who have employment and we'll make sure that employers are offering good times. But guess who fought it? Y'all, we fought it. Emer physicians fought it, not emergency physicians, we didn't exist then, but physicians fought it because we were making tons of money. The money was flowing, we didn't care if everybody had coverage because we were making enough money, it didn't really matter. And in fact, we called this program in the 40s and 50s socialist and communist. And guess what? It worked. Those labels worked 80 years ago, and it works today. So then what happened is in the 50s and 60s, um, sorry, I lost my page here. Oh, okay. In the 50s and 60s, Healthcare costs started rising because frankly, we got really good at curing stuff. We started finding new treatments. We started finding new diagnostic modalities. Healthcare got really, really expensive. And so Lyndon Johnson um, helped push through Medicare and Medicaid. So we started offering health insurance coverage to a certain population, that is the elderly and those who are impoverished, disabled. Um, but it stopped short of complete universal coverage. Um, we started doing really well in the 60s and 70s, but it got really expensive, healthcare did again. So Nixon actually, again, a conservative, once again tried to in introduce universal coverage, but this time the liberals stopped it. So the Clintons came out and said, no, 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 we got the solution, we're gonna get this figured out. And this time the conservatives stopped it. And then Obama came along and actually was able to pass the Affordable Care Act, which is by far the biggest revision to healthcare since Johnson in the 60s. And why was Obama able to pass it this time when no other president since Johnson was able to pass healthcare? Y'all, it's because of us. The American Medical Association stepped up and said, we think this is gonna be good for our patients and this is gonna be good for our profession, just like I started at the beginning. We recognize that having healthcare coverage and healthcare access is better for our patients and we supported it. And so that's the only reason this was able to pass. And so I wanna talk about how you can get involved now because this only happens when people are active and trying to make a difference in their own way. You can, if you wanna be super passive, totally fine. You can educate yourself more on policy. This is an article that yours truly wrote in EM Resident, uh, EMRA's um, publication that you can get published in. Um, but if you want to learn more about balance billing, you can read an article or something like that. If you want to dive into the advocacy handbook, that's a really great resource. Um, actually, EMRA's Health Policy Committee is doing a monthly um, book club where they're reading a chapter every month of that book so that you can get, uh, you can become a real policy expert that way. Um, you can go to conferences. So ASEP is virtual this year. Um, and while it's expensive for students, quite frankly, the, all of EMRA's events are totally free for students and residents. Um, and we'll have many talks on policy and health disparities in medicine, medicine, racism in medicine. There's a lot of good ways that you can sort of uh, scratch that itch if this is stuff that interests you. You can also frankly get involved in organizations. Obviously, as the president-elect of EMRA, I'm gonna support EMRA. There are many ways to get involved. TCEP is an excellent organization. I was in San Antonio and I was involved in the Bear County Medical Society. Uh, you can get involved in your medical school, your residency. Um, of course, many people here are uh, involved in that sort of thing, but you don't have to take a leadership role. You can, of course, just join the organization. Just start getting our monthly emails. I send out our monthly emails, um, at least until I'm president, then I, uh, you won't see my name on them anymore. But um, you, can, you can be kind of passive that way. If you join EMRA, you automatically become a member of ASEP, which is a giant organization with a lot of uh, advocacy resources behind them. If you're a little more interested than just joining EMRA, which I imagine if you're on this call, you probably have already done, you can get involved with the committee. We have, uh, it, it varies some, but at this time we have 18 different committees. 
Um, two that people on this call might be particularly interested in are the Health Policy Com Committee and our newest committee, Social Emergency Medicine. That committee is growing by leaps and bounds. I think it's already the fourth largest committee in MRAM, and it just was, it just spun off of health policy when I was chairing it last year. So it's very recent, a year and a half ago, maybe. Um, but MR committees are free to join. Literally just Google MR committees and you'll find the information there. If you're super interested, you can also uh, get signed up for ASEPS 911 network. If y'all do only one thing, I would recommend that you do this. So I'm gonna be really clear real quick and I'm just gonna take a pause. You don't have to be a policy expert. You do not have to join all these committees. You do not have to be a leader in medicine. You don't have to talk to your elected officials, which I'm gonna to talk to in a little bit every time we go to the Hill. But I'm telling you, we can't do it alone. I cannot do this alone. The people that you see here cannot do this alone. We need your help and we don't always need your help. But every so often, if we say pick up the phone, you have got to pick up the phone and call because we're only effective in numbers. I showed you that slide of nurses going to Hill Day. They turn out and that is how they're able to get their message communicated. Um, so anyway, that's my little soapbox is you don't have to be involved all the time, but you gotta be involved sometimes. And this is a great way to know when do I need to send an email? When do I need to be involved? Otherwise, I don't, I'm not gonna pay attention. And to a certain extent, that's acceptable. You're busy people. Um, if you are ambitious and you want to go to a leadership and advocacy conference, that would be excellent. Uh, this is something ASAP offers every spring. It was virtual last year. We'll see what happens this year. Um, I always like a camera, which is why I said yes to a presentation like this. Thanks, Lauren, for the offer. But so there's RJ, of course, down front and center. He made sure that he was seen. Um, and then, of course, these are all people in your TSEP MSC who have decided to take the efforts to get involved, to actually step up and do it. So if you wanna get in leadership, there are many ways that you can get in leadership. Emmer is a great way to join. Also, if TSET isn't your bag. Um, and then of course, if you wanna take it to the next level, so we're talking about next level stuff. We're already talking about leadership positions now. You of course can write about policy. So that policy handbook that I showed you is updated every few years and that's because policies change at a very fast rate. That's already the fifth edition. It was only created maybe a decade, 10 or 12 years ago. Um, but already my chapter on balance building has many things that are outdated on it. And that's because the policy landscape changes so much. If you want to be a part of changing that policy landscape or informing people about it, submitting an article to EM resident is an easy project that you can do. I won't say it's easy. It's, um, there is a well-worn path for you to follow where we can help support you. You can get uh, mentorship. You can, uh, will help connect you to people who in the policy world who can serve as co-authors or editors for you. Um, that's a really good way to get involved. Um, an easier way even is the Policy Prescriptions Journal Club. So this is a, a, a partnership that EMRA has with a private organization, actually with Cedric Dark's organization. He's over in Houston. He's a huge policy guru. And if you've got health policy in your sites as a career, he's definitely a good one to know. Um, but he runs the Policy Prescription uh, website and EMRA partners with them to do a monthly journal club where basically uh, a student or a resident reads a policy article, usually a hot topic in policy that's uh, published, and then gives a summary. So this isn't original research, this is a journal club um, where you describe it. It's a really nice way to get a CV credit on your resume also to get published, both of these are. Um, you could also, if you really are passionate about policy, we've talked about a lot of issues that affect you and your bottom line and affect your patients. EMRA is a democratic organization, we only, can do what our resident and student members want us to do. And so that means next year when I'm president starting in October, I can speak on a lot of these topics like I'm doing passionately with you, but I cannot represent Emra speaking on these topics if you haven't given us the explicit permission to speak on these issues. This is how things like um, and promoting making sure that women who are pregnant don't have to work night shifts in their second and third trimesters, since we know that they have worse outcomes and higher rates of miscarriages, higher rates of premature births uh, if they're working night shifts. That's a policy that EMRA wanted to speak about, but couldn't speak about until our members proposed a resolution and uh, passed it through our representative council. This is a great time to be thinking of this, if there's something that you're interested in, uh, if there's something you see another specialty doing that you think EM should be doing. Our policy, or our deadline for resolution submission is September, I think, 11th, um, and these will be debated and discussed and voted on at our representative council meeting. 
It's kind of like the House of Representatives for Emergency Medicine Residents. Um, that meeting is um, uh, in October 27th, I believe. So that's when these will actually be passed. And you can watch that process also. You can be an active participant in that process during the debate portion. And if you're a representative, uh, if any residents are on the call, you could actually attend this and vote on that as well. Um, okay. Oh, here's the other big thing. You can talk to elected officials. I wanna to talk to you all about this. This is Representative uh, Ruiz, the member of Congress that I worked with in DC. He was a great guy. Um, these people are not intimidating. People who are, so take it from somebody who worked to get people elected and then who worked in their offices. You don't have to have any education to be elected to office. You, have to, you don't have to know anything about medicine or education or healthcare. You have to know nothing. In Ohio, state representatives are paid something like $45,000 a year to work full time. These are people who uh, have to have other jobs to, if they want a lucrative uh, lifestyle, uh, the lifestyle that a lucrative income would afford. And so they are hungry for you to provide information to them, for you to pick up the phone or to meet with them and educate them. If you think that an elderly woman with nausea should not be afraid of going to the emergency department to find out if maybe she's having a heart attack or maybe it's just nausea, you need to make sure that your elected officials are educated on this issue or else they will not enforce the prudent layperson standards that are already there. If you think that patients should not be in the middle of the surprise billing fight that frankly doctors and insurance companies need to battle it out themselves without ever putting patients in the middle, you need to raise your voice. They're incredibly approachable and to be honest, if you have uh, a medical student in your bio line, or very soon, if you have DO or MD in your bio, they will take your call. They know that you're an authority because you are among the most highly educated people in this country. And to be honest, this is something else we can talk about later if you'd like, but money is what lubricates things. And they know that physicians are eventually gonna have money and may donate to them. And in fact, ASAP donates uh, through our PAC, donates millions every year to these candidates. I actually got to help endorse one of the candidates running for office. Um, uh, to replace, um, uh, oh my gosh, what's his name? Starts with an H, I think. Um, anyway, um, Gina Ortiz Jones, uh, NEMPAC ended up uh, endorsing, and I got to interview congressional candidates and decide who ASAP was gonna give or NEMPAC was gonna give money to, and that's a really exciting thing. There's many ways that you can get involved in this. If you'd like to know more, if you'd like to talk about any of these issues in more detail, this is my contact information. Screenshot it if you don't already have it. I know that your TSEP MSC leaders can know how to get a hold of me. Um, but I welcome, you're welcome to text or email or call if you want to discuss the residency application process. Um, if you want to discuss any of these issues or how to get more involved, I would love to chat with you. And um, because this is my favorite headshot that was ever taken, I'm going to go ahead and leave it here as the last screen as I take questions. And look at that, 146 slides in 53 minutes. I'm very excited about that. Are there any questions? Hello, I have a question. Uh, first of all, that was really interesting. Um, I'm a US citizen, but I'm studying in Europe and there's not a lot of insight into the US healthcare system except what I see on Twitter. Um, so this was really, really insightful. And my question is, it might seem a bit naive, but are there studies that show that the NPPs provide different services than EM doctors or in what, so I know that their training is much shorter and logically it would make sense that EM doctors give a different kind of care, but is there anything that we can specifically point out as this is what, what makes us a little bit better? That's a great question. And a lot of people say that that is the way that we're gonna differentiate ourselves. We would, we would like to say that our training, that many hours difference of training, differentiates us from NPPs. But of course, the fact that they're gaining more independent authority shows that that is not necessarily the case. So um, there is a movement to have better research to show um, uh, are the outcomes the same? Maybe they should have independent practice or are they not the same? As I think a lot of us know antidotally and, and feel, but we don't necessarily have the data for. Um, it will not surprise you to hear that the NPPs are very good at pumping out data like this. Um, it is not scientifically rigorous, um, but they will show that patients like the care they receive better. 
um, from NPPs, that they're uh, more patient-centered. And so we're up against um, uh, that for sure. So I would say this is an area that is ripe for research, that we need to uh, uh, invest in that. And again, I, I think that NPPs do not provide the same kind of care that a physician provides. But if I am wrong, then the science should support that and we will certainly adapt our position, I think, we as physicians. So that's a great question and uh, I hope that you help step up to find the answer. Um, I am seeing um, what is Emra's stance on gun violence and what are they doing to address it? That is excellent. I don't know off the top of my head, I'm not gonna to try to provide information that I don't know, but I do know that Emra has something called a policy compendium um, that can be Googled. I saw somebody was, uh, Lauren, maybe you could Google Emra policy compendium and give us the link in there since you've been so good about links so far. Um, and then that's easily searchable also, you can find gun violence. Um, I know that we um, have taken positions that we are, um, like many medical organizations, we recognize the uh, effects that gun violence has on our patients and that we would like to find public health, uh, we would like additional public health research into reducing gun violence. But as far as additional steps that we take, we have taken, I can't answer that off the top of my head, I'm sorry. Um, what are your opinions on EM physicians being hired by the hospital versus hired by outside groups? That's a great question, Enrique. I have to say, I um, didn't apply to any specific hospital. Um, academic institutions, you would apply directly and have like maybe a hospital employed position or a medical school employed position. But hospitals are rarely hiring emergency physicians directly these days. They're often going to groups. And there's many kinds of groups. There's like small democratic groups. That's the older kind. And it's basically a bunch of emergency doctors who got together and said, we're going to take the contract that the hospital is offering will run your emergency department for you. Um, and so uh, you would apply to ABC emergency physicians as opposed to applying to Mass General Hospital or something like that. Um, of course, uh, you may be aware that um, uh, CMGs, corporate medical groups, um, have uh, taken over many of those smaller groups. So groups like Envision or Team Health or uh, US Acute Care Solutions. Um, have swallowed up a bunch of those groups, and um, that's who you actually apply to. So you rarely even have the luxury of applying to a hospital. When I was interviewing, I'll just give you some of my personal experience. I interviewed in San Antonio and several places in Ohio. All of them were associated with the, the larger CMGs. The group that I signed with um, is uh, technically a small democratic group, but we are co-owned, so we have a partnership with Team Health. Um, so we do have some of that CMG influence, which frankly, I didn't necessarily want. I think there are some benefits, but there's a lot of risk with CMGs, but I didn't have a choice in the matter. Literally, there was nowhere I could work, but I wanted to work. That was anywhere close to where I wanted to live that I wouldn't have to work for somebody associated with the CMG. Um, and CMGs, since, oh well, no, we're running out of time. I'm going to stop talking about that right now. Any last questions before we move on so Lauren doesn't hit me? Um, what or Blake is sending me messages about the timing. Yes, go ahead. Oh, Sorry. Um, as far as being interested in advocacy, um, working with sort of outside groups, like, you know, groups that are focused on a particular area of policy versus being involved through like AMRA, being, being involved through like the human rights campaign, like which, I don't know, do you have any like thoughts or advice on yeah. along those things? Um, it will not surprise you that I have a lot of opinions on a lot of things. So I will talk to you about this one. So when I was involved in politics, I was involved in everything. I, I, I was interested in zoning policy and traffic laws. I was interested in federal health care policy. I was involved in a lot of things. When I ended up going into EM, I decided I'm only going to focus on EM. But I'm gonna focus on a lot of different parts of EM. Though my specialty has been in surprise billing area, um, I focus on um, the, the law that I wrote that um, has passed the house is actually on um, nicotine prevention in kids. So it's pretty broad stuff that I'm still doing. And if you wanna get involved in an organization like EMRA, we can help you either find your niche or do broad stuff. But if you want a more specialized thing, I would say that there are many great groups for you to get involved with. 
if you want to do something super of the moment, Get Us PPE is a very good one. Um, it was um, started by, I believe, Megan Rainey, um, who is, I think, in New York City, who's an emergency physician, um, became quite a big movement. If you're interested in women in medicine, there's something called Feminem, um, and they are a group about of, of women in emergency medicine that are highlighted. They have a conference coming up in, I think, early October that you can attend virtually. Emra is playing a big part of that with them, too. Uh, Emra also supports a scholarship with a group called Affirm. Um, I can't remember what it stands for, but firearms is one of the F's that are in there, basically firearm research, um, also started by Megan Rainey. And it, that is basically saying, since um, there was an amendment that firearm research can't be funded um, to a large extent by the NIH or the CDC, that we'll band together, we'll get private funding, and we'll do our own research on firearms so that we can get the answers that we need about how to do firearm prevention. So if you're fired up about that, you can join with the firm. And again, Emmer actually supports um, uh, them by having by financially and also by having uh, a seat on their board provided by a resident. So there's lots of good ways um, that you can find your niche. If you have a specific niche that you'd like to get involved in that I haven't already mentioned, then shoot me a message and uh, we can chat more and I can, uh, if I don't know the answer, I'll help you get the answer. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sontag, for giving up part of your weekend, and I know the time that you spent preparing this. We really appreciate it, and we appreciate you giving us um, an overview of some of the topics important to emergency medicine, as well as tangible things that we as you know, physicians in training can get involved with right now and in the future. So we really appreciate your time. Congratulations on your position and good luck this with your upcoming term as president of IMRA this next year. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. Feel free to reach out. We really appreciate it. And you guys, like you said, there's his contact information right there. Um, oh, I'm going... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no. I'm sure you got it if you want to send it out. Feel free to message anyone on the MSC.